Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Feinstein for holding this hearing. I'd like to thank uh, our experienced uh, and um, a constructive panel uh, for your testimony today. And I'd like to especially thank you, Senator Tillis, uh, for your partnership in yeah. you know, crafting and introducing this Special Counsel Integrity Act. Um, and I'm also grateful to a number of other colleagues, uh, Ranking Member Conyers and Congressman Jones, uh, for introducing a bipartisan companion bill in the House, uh, and uh, Senators uh, Graham and Booker Whitehouse and Blumenthal and Representative Jackson Lee. The fact that this group of members from across the ideological spectrum uh, from both chambers uh, have engaged in legislative efforts to try uh, and provide some modest, effective strengthening of the special counsel, I think shows that this goes beyond uh, temporary partisan concerns and reflects uh, a deeper concern, um, something that um, reaches past the importance of Special Counsel Mueller's ongoing investigation, itself an important issue for all Americans, uh, and goes to the integrity of our government. Uh, and to the rule of law. I respect and share Senator Tillis's uh, statement at the outset that our motivations in moving this bill forward uh, go beyond what is just in front of us in terms of Special Counsel Mueller um, and reflects a much deeper commitment to rule of law. Uh, so I'm also pleased that uh, more than a dozen groups and individuals have uh, written us expressing their support for the value of this legislation. I'd like to uh, submit for the record a uh, letter to that effect without objection. Um, and if I might, uh, just to pick up um, where some of that questioning uh, just was uh, from Senator Cruz, Professor Vladek, um, is it possible um, for uh, commentators, including even a justice, uh, to appraise um, Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison, um, yet it's still to be good law? In fact, I think you've said the Supreme Court has cited Morrison dozens of times without overruling any portion of the decision. Is that correct? Yeah, and I would just say, I mean, so Professor Amar mentioned Justice Kagan in the speech he gave at Stanford. You know, I went back and reread um, then Professor Kagan's 2001 Harvard Law Review article on presidential administration, where she goes out of her way to say that she thinks the unitary executive theory at the heart of Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison um, is wrong. Um, and so I don't know why we can't simultaneously be of the view that there are great opinions written by justices in history with which we disagree on the constitutional law. So if I could ask, just bluntly, is Morrison good law? To me it is, and I think to a majority of the court it has been. Let me ask, you made an important, I think, statement earlier, which is that all these two bills do is guarantee a right to judicial review that already exists. Could you just briefly explain that? Sure. I mean, so I, I mentioned the Nader versus Bork case from 1973. Right. You know, the... The Nader versus Bork case is based on the theory that when you have a regulation protecting then the special prosecutor, that regulation is judicially enforceable, um, whether through a declaratory uh, judgment or through a suit for injunctive relief. Um, and indeed, Judge Gassell ended up holding in Nader versus Bork that acting Attorney General Bork violated the regulation um, when he fired special counsel, special prosecutor Cox. I think you could make the same argument about the existing regulation part 600. That 600.7D actually could be enforced today um, if in fact the special counsel were removed. The tricky part, and I mentioned this in my testimony, Senator, there's a provision in the regulation, I think it's 600.10, that I think could be argued to prevent such enforcement. Um, that's, that provision did not appear in the Watergate era regulation. Right. So it would be an open question as to what role that has on the ability to enforce the regulation today. Some could argue, if I could, um, Professor Posner, that um, the special counsel bills we're talking about are significantly less intrusive on the power of the executive than the independent counsel statute that was at, was at issue in Morrison. Um, can we just take a quick review of those? Uh, Justice Scalia in his dissent was particularly vituperative about the idea that the independent counsel was appointed based on a referral from Congress under a very deferential standard and actually approved uh, by a judicial panel. Is that the case now with these special counsel provisions? No, that's not the case, and that's one of the major reasons why these bills are much less intrusive on presidential power than the independent uh, counsel law was. So the appointment is different. Is the oversight also different? The, uh, yes, um, the independent counsel had uh, significant independence, budgetary independence, and independence over investigation. Uh, there, there's, there was, it's somewhat ambiguous whether it even had to follow Justice Department regulations. And Where, are the removal provisions today different with special counsel than it was with independent counsel, and in that the decision remains within the executive branch? Uh, the removal provision is, is weaker in the sense of more favorable to the president, uh, both in terms of the substance. It includes 
uh, reasons that are not that were not in the removal provision of the independent council. And again, it's it's entirely within the uh, authority of the attorney general. Let me ask you a last um, area of question, if I might. Um, Scalia's core argument in the dissent is that the president must have complete control over the law enforcement function. Um, your testimony states the founders never believed that the president should be given complete control over law enforcement and in, instead um, that there are many other restrictions on the president's control of the law enforcement function that exist now um, and that there are other instances where there are good cause restrictions on firing civil service protections, reporting requirements, inspectors general. Could you just briefly explain why that's relevant here as we consider whether or not the protections we are trying to advance um, violate separation of powers? Well, uh, yeah, that's a, a complicated question, but to be brief, many people put a great deal of weight on the, founding understand, the founders' understanding of the Constitution. But in this particular case, what the founders' views were were, were fairly ambiguous. There, are, uh, there is evidence, though, that they would never have taken the position that uh, Justice Scalia attributed to them. They explicitly, in the text of the Constitution, give Congress various powers and opportunities to control how the president uses his executive power, including by defining um, offices, for example, the involvement of the Senate in appointments, and of course, Congress's budgetary power, which you can use in many ways to influence how the president actually ends up exercising executive power. This idea that the branches are completely s separate and autonomous that one sometimes hear is not actually uh, in the Constitution. They're allowed to influence each other in many ways. Thank you, Professor. I'd like to thank the whole panel. You've given a number of constructive suggestions, some of them more aspirational, some of them more tactical, uh, but in any event, all of them constructive, and I very much look forward uh, to working with my colleagues to advance this legislation. Thank you.